I'll definitely do All right, check one, two. Becky, can you hear me? Check one, two. I'll try to keep the volume as level as I can. Do I need the Brittany mic? Send me a text, Becky. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. Appreciate it. Okay, as I said um, last week, proximate cause is the most nebulous concept that we're going to be dealing with. Um, in this course, so I'm on 335. Okay, the opening paragraph, right from Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Company B. Daniel. Second sentence, therefore, courts and their finitude do not attempt to deal with cause and effect in any absolute degree, but only in such a limited way as is practical and as is within the scope of ordinary human understanding. Hence, arbitrary limits have been set. We're gonna, you know, and such qualifying words as proximate and natural have come into use as, as setting the limits beyond which the courts will not look in an attempt to trace the connection between a given cause and a given effect. Further down, we then say in common speech that the wrong was a cause of the injury. But to make such a standard that if the cause had not existed, the effect would not have occurred, the basis of legal responsibility would soon prove very unsatisfactory, for a reductio ad absurdum may be promptly established by calling to mind that if the injured person had never been born, the injury would not have happened. So the courts ask another question What was the wrongful act? Was the wrongful act the proximate cause? Okay, so what are we, after having read this chapter, sorry, for those of you scoring at home, can you still see me? Yes, sir. Um, so what are we really talking about here? Sam, what do you got? Uh, first of all, I'm going to 
pretty much an official or a potential cause of an injury with a meaning in your life. We're talking about all right. Whether or not you have a case. Well, no, I mean, when we say proximate, we're talking about what, what does proximate mean, Mr. Allen? Uh, proximate? Yes. Meaning something along the lines of you know, you were associated with it, but you're not necessarily the definitive. You're, you've got a boundary inside of whether or not you are liable. And so there's there's bounds inside of that, whether you are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, uh, 49% versus 51 No, no, that's the <laughs> I just drew it. Yes, ma'am. Is it immediately after or before? Right, it's close, right? Proximate means close, right? Immediately after, before, or even in, you know, no, close in both time and distance, okay? All right? So at some point, and we see the word arbitrary come up several times in this chapter, right? At some point, there's a line beyond which, you know, you've got cause here, and you got a, this is a cause, right? You got an injury here, right? I've got a dot and then a circle. This is the part where it gets hard on the zoom. Okay, and then you've got another injury from the same cause here, and a third injury from the same cause here okay there's a line upon which any arbitrary line right beyond which this act this actor and the act that this person has performed this injury this injury is too attenuated that because the law right Even though this is the but for cause of this injury of Z, okay, it's not close enough in time or duration to have been foreseeable. And therefore, even though it's the but for cause, the law is not going to hold the, per the actor liable for this injury that falls outside the line. Okay, and where the line is set, again, this is why it's a nebulous concept. <coughs> Is arbitrary and it's set by the courts in different jurisdictions. It's a wider circle for different acts. And as we learn shortly in the notes, an intentional act broadens the circle. Where you see, and then you've got, you know, injury A, right? For the intentional act would still be liable to Z, but maybe not to somebody even further out here. Okay. You with me? No, yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Notes one and two on 335 ask the question, you know, how close does it need to be in time? Like how much time and distance, right? And we see the, the note later, the hypothetical, you know, a chauffeur, it's in Justice Andrews' dissenting opinion in Paul's graph, right? A chauffeur runs into it, negligently runs into a truck. The truck explodes, okay? Kills somebody on the sidewalk and then flings some glass, breaks the glass in the building and person B is uh, blinded by the glass. And then, you know, a nanny drops a baby a, a whole block away, okay? It is likely that um, yeah, so the decedent is X, the uh, last victim is Y, and the baby, the baby dropped by the by the nanny a block away is Z. X and Y, we can pretty much say, okay, that might be 
the foreseeable result, okay, of negligently causing an explosion, but is the, can we really hold the chauffeur liable for the dropping of the baby a, a whole block away? Okay. And it's all about foreseeability. Okay. Notice in note three, last four lines. Both terms are often used to include cause and fact, a necessary predicate to an inquiry about proximate cause. If cause and fact is not present, then there is no need to inquire whether there is proximate cause. Okay. What the, the case, remember the case last week um, about the railroad and the, 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 product and the speed of the rail, the rail car, right? We didn't have cause and fact there, so there's no need to inquire as to the proximate cause. I like note five a lot. Halfway down. In contrast, proximate cause or legal cause concerns a determination of whether legal liability should be imposed where cause and fact has been established. Proximate or legal cause is a policy decision made by the legislature or the courts to deny liability for otherwise actionable conduct based on considerations of logic, common sense, policy, precedent, and are more or less inadequately expressed ideas of what justice demands or what is administratively possible and convenient. And in note six, you have the quote, an actor's liability is limited to those harms that, re that result from the risks that made the actor's conduct tortious. The risks that made the actor's conduct tortious. We'll talk more about that as we go on. Cena, tell me about Ryan v. New York Central. And speak up so everybody at home can hear you, please. Sure. Okay. Um, the relevant facts, the railroad company set fire to its own woodshed. That fire then jumped to a house and then also burned a number of other houses. So the issue was whether the railroad company would be held liable for all the houses that burned. And um, so the analysis was basically that, and, and the holding was affirmed, but it was affirmed that the railroad company was not going to be held liable for all the houses that burned. It did say that the analysis, the railroad company was responsible for the fire that was part of its own property. It is not held liable for the A to Z houses that burned as that factors could be heat or wind and the railroad company could not control what happened after the fire was started. So each homeowner would have to utilize their own fire insurance to cover their property. Um, and then also uh, they were talking about the responsibility to neighbors. It would create too great of a burden that um, for a neighbor to try to be responsible for something that that traveled to somebody else's property. So um, whoever negligently started the fire is only responsible for the fire they start, not responsible for how the fire might spread to other properties. Um, they, they wanted to protect it from a breakdown of community or society. And that that's why we carry insurance, protect us from hazards uh, based on our neighbor's conduct and that the damage was too remote to the cause. There you go. What year are we in? Year one. What year are we in? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, 1866. 1866. There's a note to make it clear that insurance was not readily available at the time for this sort of happenstance. Okay. In mathematical terms, mathematical terms, you said it right, correctly, right? We got the wind and the heat and the materials are made. What are we talking about here? Nature. Well, in, in mathematical power. terms. Oh. Oh, that's a probability to risk the burden. <coughs> Indeterminate variables, right? Uh, that, that's what I meant. 
So we've got A to B, right? Or, well, I hate to not use the, we'll, we'll call it. F is the line, this is the fire to the adjacent shed, okay? And so this court in 1866 says that there are so many independent variables between here and here that it would be unfair and also an undue burden, right? To hold the railroad company responsible for A, like, so where do we draw the line? Why not all the way to Z, okay? And to quote the court, thank you, Cena. Did everybody hear that at home? Can I get a nod? Anybody watching the thing? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can hear it. We heard. Yeah. Second full paragraph, 338. To sustain such a claim as the present and to follow the same to its legitimate consequences would subject to a liability against which no prudence could guard and to meet which no, and to, and to meet which no private fortune would be adequate. Okay, so again, we're setting a line as to the scope of liability, right? We're drawing the circle. Here, I mean, in this particular instance, we're drawing a really tight circle, right? It's a really tight circle. Is this the rule common now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, right? Okay, this is the evolution of the concept of proximate cause. Where, and again, as, and I disagree with Justice Andrews to a certain extent, but he uses, he says, you know, it's a public policy decision, right? Keep that in mind, okay? As a society, we have to make this decision. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're subjecting a safety, our actor here to unlimited liability. So everything that may happen for any particular act, no matter how, um, well, unforeseeable, some of these consequences may be that are both down the line in time and further away in distance, okay? Notice in note two on 339, the Kansas case where a railroad it's negligently set a fire to its tracks was held liable to the owner of a farm nearly four miles away to his property the fire spread. Kansas had at the time of the decision, many miles of uninsured grain and its community attitude toward railroads was not necessarily the same as that of New York. Do these factors account for the difference in opinions? You bet they do, right? You bet they do. You know, and in note one, we are told, we are informed that shortly after the uh, principal case was decided, the legislature in New York changed the rules. Okay. And these are all like in note four, you get, these are all rhetorical questions. Right? Like the courts of the 19th century faced the question how far liability for negligently starting a fire should, starting a fire should extend. Courts of the 21st century are facing the question how far the liability of those who neg negligently expose workers to asbestos should extend. To the workers exposed at the workplace? To the spouses who were exposed at home while laundering their clothes? To their family members who breathed in the fibers that carried on home on their clothes? To roommates? To the carpool? To fellow commuters on the bus? Right? In each of those scenarios, right, we're, that's the question. We draw the circle here, or we stop, draw the circle wider or wider. Where do we stop? 
Like how much should that company be held liable for? If I had to take a guess, then Gary, I would say, um, oh. Grace, tell me about Bartolone, please, since you're so close to the camera and people can hear you. So, Bartolone versus Bartolone Company, Bartolone Company is so the plaintiff was involved in a car crash and sustained minor injuries that aggravated a pre-existing um, schizophrenic condition where he suffered a psychotic breakdown. The defendants were found liable for the accident. Um, the plaintiff sued the defendants for causing his breakdown. The jury found in favor of the plaintiff, but the trial court set aside the verdict and the plaintiff appealed. Um, my issue is... My issue is whether a defendant may be held liable for negligence by, aggravate, by aggravating a pre-existing condition of the plaintiff. Um, and I well, let's be clear here, Grace. Say, say it again, but be, narrow it down a little bit. The what? real issue here is about what kind of pre-existing condition? Schizophrenic. A psychological condition. Yeah. Okay, all right, there you go. Keep going. Um, and my analysis is yes, the defendant must take a plaintiff as he finds him and hence he be liable for damages. Here, the car accident was the cause, in fact, of the plaintiff's minor injuries and the proximate cause of the plaintiff's breakdown. Therefore, the trial court reversed and the verdict for the plaintiff is reinstated. Okay. This is otherwise known as. Eggshell, doctor. I think you can't hear me. <laughs> I think you're right. Eggshell, doctor. That's what we take from this, okay? This is the eggshell skull doctrine. A plaintiff must, a, a defendant must take the plaintiff as he or she finds them. Okay, so I like the distinction. Grace caught it. Yes, the accident was the cause, in fact, of the minor injuries, but they were also the proximate cause of the exacerbation of a pre existing psychological condition. Notice in the notes, some jurisdictions limit it to pre existing physical characteristics. Okay, but generally, well, at least in this jurisdiction, it also applies to pre-existing psychological conditions. Did y'all see uh, over the weekend that the, the, the uh, parents of that Stanford athlete that, who killed herself are trying to sue the school for her suicide uh, based on um, the fact that they sent her a disciplinary letter the day of her suicide. I mean, do we have causation issues there? You bet we do, right? Um, I don't think they're going to get over the hump with that one, but I thought it was very interesting. Somebody took that case because, I mean, the school would have had to know that she was fragile to begin with and was it really negligent to have sent her a disciplinary letter if she I mean, I don't know the whole story, but you got causation issues. Yes. I think that something also that's going around, especially with female athletes, is, there, is abuse or stuff from coaches. So maybe they're saying there was something with that. That's a, that's a, that's a, thing, that's a, a factor. Yes, ma'am. They're arguing that uh, the letter had to do with um, some kind of uh, interference or sexual misconduct. I'm not sure what exactly was from the ball. She had. There was something about a spilled cup of coffee. Yeah, it had to do with like some interaction with the ball players. Uh, yes. Yeah. But right. I guess, I guess your real point is on this eggshell skull concept is that if you have a tort against somebody, you have a car accident, and they have a really minor 
you know, fender bender, but they hit their head on their steering wheel and crack open their skull, and they have a paper thin, you know, brain cap that you bought. Whatever damage that you have done to them, you're liable for it. Your your client is liable for that. So it's very it, it transcends a lot of issues. And here they show it in psychology. Right. In other aspects, I mean, it could transcend childbirth, bone structure, um, hemophilia. I was going for that direction exactly. Right. If you so, accidentally, you know, I always use the. You know, well, I saw it happen. Um, we were out playing darts one night, and somebody got mad, and slapped the slapped the dart out of the board because they missed, and it struck somebody in the leg. Right now, if it, it was a, you know, it was an out sort of situation at the time, right? But think about it. Let's say that that you know that dart it entered the leg of a severe hemophiliac. And they, you know, bled out before anybody could stop. Them. You know, that's he, that person that slapped that dart would have been on the hook for the wrongful death of that person. Okay, that's the way. Okay, very good, Mr. Allen. Look at the last five lines. All right, well. Note two, all states are agreed, all states, upon the rule stated in this case when unforeseeable consequences flow from a physical injury to the person of the plaintiff. Okay. And then note three tells me, tells us what I said earlier. A few courts have limited the doctrine to pre-existing physical condition, but I do like the last five lines of, um, from the third restatement. When an actor's tortious conduct causes harm to a person that because of a pre-existing physical or mental condition or other characteristics of this person is of a greater magnitude or different type that might reasonably be expected, the actor is nevertheless subject to liability for all such harm to the person. And note four, this is a subjective uh, issue, right? It applies to the proximate cause issue of a, a victim, not the breach of the duty, negligence, or the defect, strict liability. Okay? Ms. Graydon, tell me about Polemus. Just the facts. Um, so in this case, there was a plank that fell off of a ship and caused another ship to catch fire, which destroyed it. Um, the charters had contended that the damages were too remote um, to actually be the cause of their ship setting fire, and the court had determined that they were not too remote, and that given a uh, the negligence that the damage well, wait a minute now let's let's let, let's let's we gotta we gotta we gotta let's go over the facts yes yeah, so we got a falling plank into what so um, into the water it fell into yeah. a stove and caused an explosion and set fire to the cargo ship right not into the water it fell into the hold of the ship where oh, there okay. was benzene what is benzene I'm not sure, but it's gas. Gas, okay. Why don't they just say gas? Yeah. Uh, but it caused an explosion and it caused their the, European the cargo ship to catch fire. And they had said that they should not be liable because the damages were too remote. Um, but the court had found that they were not too remote and that because their negligence caused the plank to drop and the plank dropping caused the fire and caused the explosion, then they were liable for that. Okay. So are we arguing that there wasn't a breach of duty in the dropping of the plank? Yes. They no? Okay. No? Why are we not arguing that? For 
for some reason, this is the one that I did not top up. I remember reading it, but I, this is, when I looked on my notes, it was not there. Of course, this is the one I did not The defendants are conceding that there was, the, that the dropping of the plank was negative. Somebody yes. somewhere along the line, right? Yes. Messed up when they dropped the plank with the cargo. Yes. But we're arguing that what? That the damn that it was too remote to actually be. Well, give it to me in your Chelsea's words, not the words of the. Well, that that um, just because the plank got... dropped didn't mean that that was the reason that their ship caused fire. That it could have happened. It was too improbable. Yes. That's what we're saying. Remember, we're talking about foreseeability. There we go. There we go. Right? It might have caused some damage, right, to the hull of the ship or whatever, but it was unforeseeable that the whole ship would catch fire and burn up, right, just because a plank dropped into a hole. Okay? Thank you, Chelsea. Notice in the second paragraph, in the present case, the arbitrators have found as a fact, right? We have a fact that the falling of the plank was due to the negligence of the defendant's server. Remember, at the, what we talked about at the beginning of, we talked about it earlier in the term, right? Sometimes the word negligence just means the breach of the duty. Okay, so we have a find, find the fact that there was a breach of the duty. Further down, the appellate's junior counsel sought to draw a distinction between the anticipation of the extent of damage resulting from a negligent act and the anticipation of the type of damage resulting from such an act. I'm in, I'm in second paragraph in, in Lamus on 343. <clears throat> At the bottom of the page, four lines up. If the act would or might probably cause damage, the fact that the damage it in fact causes is not the exact the kind of damage one would expect is immaterial. So long as the damage is in fact directly traceable to the negligent act, the breach of the duty, right? And not due to the operation of independent causes having no connection with one with the negligent act, except that they could not avoid its result. Because of A, remember what I said last week? Because of A, then B. Okay? Do we have any indeterminate variables that happen in between A and B here? Like we talked about earlier, do we have any? No. The plank fell, the fire started, ship burned. Okay, the fact that we didn't anticipate the fact, the extent of the damage or the type of damage that would occur because of A, in this court's opinion, where are we? Court of Appeal 1921, doesn't matter. The fact Further down at the, in that last big paragraph or the last big paragraph of the case, at the top of 344, last four lines. The fact that they did not, that they did directly produce an unexpected result, a spark in an atmosphere of petrol vapor, vapor which caused the fire, does not relieve the person who was negligent from the damage which his negligent act directly caused. Okay. Notice how this relates to Bartoloni. Okay, the fact that, hey, the fact you didn't realize how badly the, the, the plaintiff was going to be injured when they flicked that dart, okay, 
doesn't matter. It's because you a you acted act A produced result B. It doesn't matter that you didn't happen to see the fact that the ship is going to burn when you drop that plank. You're still on the hook. All right. Notice in note one, the rule of this case has had considerable support in the United States. All right. Parenthetical, first parenthetical, note one, quote, consequences which follow in unbroken sequence without an intervening efficient cause from the original negligent act are natural and proximate. Again, no indeterminate variables in between A and B. I've got notes, notes three circle, note four. <clears throat> Families of some of the victims of September 11th terrorist attacks filed uh, tort claims against airlines, airport security companies, and airport operators negligently failing to act, failing to prevent the attack. Southern District of New York said, while it may be true that terrorists had not before deliberately flown airplanes into buildings, the airlines reasonably could foresee that crashes causing death and destruction on the ground was a hazard that would arise should hijackers take control of a plane. Do you agree with that? Sam does. I mean, this is on the motion for summary judgment. I, now, think about this, right? I, I, I'm pretty sure this was a motion, motion for summary judgment. So the Southern District of New York allowed it to go to a jury. Okay. This was, I mean, hindsight's 2020, right, Sam? I mean, it's certainly foreseeable now. There weren't a whole lot of people outside of think tanks that we're thinking about that before September 9-11. But planes have crashed in the, in the, you know, skyscrapers before. It might not have been too far, you know, it, maybe it will, maybe it wasn't too good. Yes. I'll tell you this, uh, containments for nuclear power plants designed since the 40s and 50s specifically evaluate the largest flying aircraft and evaluate their containment structures in the United States who are able to handle an impact from the largest flying aircraft and burning of all possible fuel on board. So foreseeable, I suspect so. I suspect inside of the airlines that they had already evaluated that as potential, and their insurance companies had already built that into their rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before 9-11? Really? Yep. Come mm -hmm. on. Ah, yeah. There's a lot of hijacking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a question. It's a question. I, I agree with that. It's a question. I don't know if that yes is the answer. Before 9-11? That's sure, previous previous hijackings were either political statements or for extortion of money or something along the lines, and it was not 
to a suicide mission. It's not a compromise. Note five talks about the wider circles for intentional torts. Okay. Somebody. They can, they can see the whiteboard. You can see it. I mean, it's far, but it's in the picture. Yeah, I want to get one. Okay, I'll That better? Yeah. Um, and it's screen, still, you still can't see you can't, the and from this main screen, it's, it's very difficult to see from the glare. I'll get a better picture of it so y'all at least know what I was it's kind of scribbling. It's huh? It's the size of the projector screen now. You just you can't, can't like, see, see, you can't the, see writing. the writing. Because of the glare? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's right up the line. That's about all the drawing I'm going to do anyway. <laughs> Somebody will get you a good picture. All right, Mr. Allen, tell me about wagon mail number one. <laughs> okay, um, let me pull this letter up here. Loud, please. It's called, I called it Burning Down the Dot. <laughs> um, so, uh, wagon mail number one, um, this went through a Privacy Council 1961. Privy. Privy. Council, Privy. Thank you. And then there's a, a follow up page to it. Uh, procedural history talks about the lower court and upper court uh, sided with the dock company that the boat owner mound was liable. This was appealed and put into the privacy uh, council who overruled the decision and reversed it, stating that the Mort dock was liable. The question I have for this was whether or not the liability should be split and both parties liable for the fire. And that is water. Uh, doesn't start on fire without the oil on top of it extensively. Water doesn't burn without water or without oil on it. So the oil doesn't burn without fire. So what happened with this is uh, mound one, they were taking on fuel oil and uh, they they were filling up this tank and somebody didn't have one of the one of the valves closed. They let it overflow in this, I believe it was uh, 61. Okay, so water regulations and stuff weren't that big a deal. They didn't have buoys around the boat at the time to protect the harbor. They didn't have the, these floating uh, booms that uh, protect the oil from going anywhere where they do fuel transfers that they do now. And so this oil that overflows because they left this valve open is going all over the harbor. Well, we know that oil floats on top of water. So it's sitting on top of this, this harbor and it's there for days. A couple of days later, some guys are welding on a pier nearby, and they let some of the slag drop into the water on a rag, which catches this rag on fire, which catches the surface of the water on fire, which burns down the dock. Who's lying? That's the question. That's the question. And is it? Okay. Essentially. <laughs> well, they're fighting over because it was substantial damage across the entire Court. That's right. Well, okay. The plaintiff's argument was I didn't So the, the plaintiff argument. here is the dot, the wharf, right? We have damage to the wharf. We got to make sure we're clear on that. We the plaintiff in this in Wagon Mound One is the wharf. Okay. And at the end of the day. Is our circle in wagon mound one more is smaller in diameter or larger in diameter than plants? Because the wharf did not take and complain about the oil spill for 
until after the fire, they said that the circle is much smaller. I believe. Yes. The circle here is smaller than in points. Okay. And I'll point you to the language at the very top of 347. It is a principle of civil liability subject only to qualifications which have no present relevance that a man must be considered to be responsible for the probable consequences of his act, for the foreseeable consequences of his act. To demand more of him is too harsh a rule. To demand less is to ignore that civilized order requires the observance of a minimum standard of behavior. So we're, we're pulling back Polemus here, just a little bit. Just underneath the picture, it is not the act, but the consequences on which tortious liability is founded. Just as, as it has been said, there is no such thing as negligence in the air, so there is no such thing as liability in the air. <clears throat> Suppose an action brought by A for damage caused by the carelessness of neutral word of B, for example, a fire caused by the careless village of oil. It may of course become relevant to know what duty B owed to A, but the only liability that is in question is the liability for damage by fire. Note one, 348, last sentence, quote, the area within which liability is imposed is that which is within the circle of reasonable foreseeability. There it is again, the third restatement quote in note two, an actor's liability is limited to those harms that result from the risks that made the actor's conduct tortious. What are we basically saying which in Wagon Mount One, right? What is the court basically saying? That a reasonable person could not have seen that the oil, which had a flash point of 170 degrees Fahrenheit, is that right? That's what it said, right? Would set fire and, and set fire to the entire wharf two days after the spillage. And so Going back to the third restatement quote, an actor, say it again, an actor's liability is limited to those harms that result from the risk that made the actor's conduct tortious. And then we have some examples. I think the most illustrative of the examples is F. When the manager of Hardwick Hall at Historic Property failed to post a warning against swimming in a pond because it could be a source of wheels disease, it risked a swimmer contracting that disease, but not that the swimmer would drown. I mean, no. Look at A, when defendant served foul smelling shrimp, he risked causing person to become ill, but not causing someone else to slip on her vomit. You 
can just think about all of those examples in terms of these circles. Like in that case, we've got, you know, the vomiter and then the slipper. Okay. Proximate cause, the, the rotten shrimp was the proximate cause, the cause in fact, and the proximate cause of the vomit. The vomit was the cause in fact, well, it's also the cause in fact of the slip, but it's not the proximate cause, right? Because the, the risk that is the risk of somebody puking and then somebody then slipping on the puke, okay, is too attenuated, it is not foreseeable, or at least it's not reasonably foreseeable. That's the point. Reasonable foreseeability. Another way of stating, I think, uh, I like in note three, Professor, later Judge Keaton suggested a general rule for Wagon Mountain One, one of which being, quote, a negligent actor is legally responsible for that harm and only that harm of which the negligent aspect of his conduct is a cause in fact. What is the difference between Wagon Mountain, what the court rules holds in Wagon Mountain 1 and Wagon Mountain 2? We're widening the circle again, right? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. You got a question? Yeah, tell me the difference. Court held that if a reasonable man can foresee and prevent the reason, he's most likely liable for the police. Okay, but uh, all right, yes, Madison. Is it like foreseeability versus damages? Yeah, well, all right, yes. Thank you. So if we if we narrow the circle, we narrow the circle in Wagon Mountain One. We go from Lemus wide, Wagon Mountain One narrow, and then we're going to draw it somewhere between Lemus and Wagon Mountain One and Wagon Mountain Two. Who are the plaintiffs? The doc. What's the plaintiff in Wagon Mountain One? Who are the plaintiffs in Wagon Mountain Two? Huh? The ships, the other ships in the harbor, right? Now, here we said it was reasonably foreseeable on whose part that the benzene or the oil would light on fire, Sam? The captain of the ship, right? So, would a reasonably prudent captain of one of these ships or the ship that was spilling the oil had stopped, would have stopped the oil in any way possible and foreseen that because even though the possibility of the oil catching fire in the harbor was remote, it doesn't mean that it was so remote that somebody in the captain's position, a reasonably prudent captain, wouldn't have stopped the oil from spilling as soon as possible. And that was not the case. Okay, so whereas the wharf failed to establish liability or in Wagon Mountain One, the ships, the ships that were damaged in the harbor did. See that? See how it flips? Okay. In Wagon Mountain One, a reasonable, just a reasonably prudent person could not have foreseen the extent of the damages okay caused by the fire right here a reasonably prudent ship's captain could have foreseen that the fire might catch on fire and therefore even though 
It was unlikely he could have foreseen the extent of the damages should the oil actually catch on fire, right? And everything that might happen after that and therefore should have done everything that he can. Look at, um, All right, first full paragraph 351. And the wag, I, this is where you're going, Master. I get it. Uh, the board were not concerned with degrees of foreseeability because the finding was that the fire was not foreseeable at all. But here the finding showed further down that some risk of fire would have been present in the mind of a reasonable man in the shoes of the ship's chief engineer. So the first question must be what is the precise meaning to be attached in this context to the words foreseeable and reasonably foreseeable? Skip a paragraph, but it does not follow that no matter what the circumstances may be, it is justifiable to neglect a risk of such a small magnitude. A reasonable man would only neglect such a risk if he had some valid reason for doing so. For example, that it would involve considerable expense to eliminate the risk. He would weigh the risk against the difficulty of eliminating it. What does that remind us of? Huh? Just learning he ended his eyebrows, right? B is last in PL. Right? If the magnitude of the risk, right, the probability of the magnitude of the risk is less than the burden of eliminating it, or is more than the burden of eliminating it, then you have a duty to eliminate it. Okay? Here, the probability of the oil setting fire and burning up, burning down the wharf and the, cut, the ships is small, but if it does catch fire, the magnitude of the loss is huge. See that? Last three lines on 351, but this does not mean that a reasonable man would dismiss such a risk from his mind and do nothing when it was so easy to prevent it. If it is clear that the reasonable man would have realized or seen and permitted the risk, then it must follow that the appellant is liable in damages. I've got a uh, note four in the, tramp the trampoline canvas uh, blowing away in the storm circle. Proximate cause is generally left to the province of the jury. Unless it is so clear something was um, not reasonably foreseeable to a reasonable person. All right, the Mac Daddy of them all. Paul's graph, who wants it? Addison, you came two weeks in a row on a Monday night. Which one was it? You did the Paul's graph. I skipped that one in the next because they were so long. You skipped Paul's graph? I did that one in the next Delta, you want to do this one? Yes, we do myself. And um, is the plaintiff we got to get the facts right. You know, I got to get the facts right. Yes, the plaintiff brought forth a claim of negligence for injuries sustained when the defendant's employees assisted a man on a on board a moving train. And while in the process, an unidentified package the man was carrying, uh, which contained fireworks, exploded and injured the plaintiff. The trial court had found in favor of the plaintiff, which the appellate court affirmed. The issue for this court is whether the defendant breached the duty to the plaintiff, although there was no reasonable way he could have known the package contained fireworks. Um, the rule is that in order to prevail on a cause for negligence, it must be proven that the physical invasion of the plaintiff's person was violated and that the act that violated it was um, 
the, that the defendant have breached the duty to the plaintiff uh, and could have avoided or evaded the injury through their acts. All right. So, okay. Well, Chelsea did it. It's over. See y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I got questions. Okay. No. All right. Who's who's the plaintiff? The Chelsea. plaintiff is the individual that was injured. How was she injured? She was standing on the platform and whenever the how far was, away from several the, feet away. Several feet. And there's conflicting testimony about that, but Justice Cardozo puts it in his view, she was at least 25 feet away. How was she injured? Um, through the base of the explosion, it says call it scales. I uh, yeah. imagine like shards. You're so young. No, it was the scale where they used to weigh, like, oh, okay. weigh things and fell over. Oh, um, okay. I don't think the explosion caused like some basically debris to come out, no, but man. I guess the scale fell over and injured her. Yeah, that's because right. Because of the explosion. We're going on a railroad. Okay. <laughs> What what is the primary fact that Justice Cardozo focuses upon when he's talking about? So he was saying that basically the defendants or the employees could have not reasonably foreseen that the package contained fireworks and that they, while that they were not negligent like there could have been transferred intent for see if they were negligent and help assisting the man and dropping the package and creating creating the explosion but that they weren't negligent because they weren't putting him at danger they were actually trying to keep him out of danger Ooh, and to say i don't even say that is it not so no, it's not it's not not. It. you got well i mean you, you caught the key words there okay all right like the scales okay yes. People didn't have their own little shopping bags back in 1921. Okay. So they used to walk around with stuff wrapped in newspapers. Okay. I know you're sorry. You see it in the movies. All right. It's not like I was alive in 1921 either, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. got to tell the story right trains pulling out two guys three guys actually have what are nondescript packages of newspaper under their arms there is a, a railroad employee on the train pulling dude right and there is a railroad on, employee on platform pushing dude okay now Paul's draft is standing 25 feet away from the train. And we've got the guy trying to get on. Here is, you know, kind of Okay. He makes a big point to say that there is no way anyone could have known that this nondescript wrapped new package in the newspaper would blow up if it was dropped. There's no way, okay? And so he said it might very well be that the employee pushing and the employee pulling the guy might have had a duty to him, okay? As the, because he was trying to get on the train and, and notice how close they are together how wide this circle is, okay, that they may have owed a duty to him, but she was so far away and they couldn't possibly have known that the uh, package would blow up, that they didn't have a duty, like all this proximate cause stuff, Justice Cardozo is focusing on who owes a duty to whom. It's a relational concept, okay? Negligence in the air. You know, will not fit. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Okay.
And again, we're talking about foreseeability. First full paragraph, 358. The conduct of the defendant's guard, if a wrong in its relation to the holder of the package, if a wrong in relation to the holder of the package, was not a wrong in its relation to the plaintiff standing far away. Relatively to her, it was not negligence at all. Nothing in the situation gave notice that the falling package had in, its, in the potency or peril to persons thus removed. In other words, it was not foreseeable at all that the falling package had in it the potency of peril to persons thus removed. Negligence is not actionable unless it involves the invasion of a legally protected interest, the violation of a right. Proof of negligence in the air, so to speak, will not do. Okay. And he's also saying, okay, and so he's saying that if indeed defendant owed a duty to the guy holding the package, right? Paul's draft claim is based because he didn't have a duty to her, is is a derivative claim based on the duty to the guy holding the package. He goes, I'm not even sure that there was a duty owed to the guy holding the package because of the non strip nature of the package. Okay. Even then, even if he did, there was no particular duty owed to Paul's draft standing 25 feet away when there was not, it was not reasonably foreseeable by anybody on the platform, including the defendant, that the thing was going to blow up. Okay, does that make sense? What's up? Let's, let's put a little action to this. This, yeah. this is most likely in 21, a moving train and pulling out of the station. And that's why you got a guy on the train trying to help the last person on board. Sure. On board, and a guy on the, um, on the platform giving him a push up there. I mean, that's most likely what you've got in today's day and age, you don't think about that. I mean, they close the doors, everything's secure, the engineer looks down the track. In 1921, they're moving. Like streetcar of California type, San Francisco type. Oh yeah, I mean. So yeah. when, when you put that in there, these guys are just doing their job. And so that's why the chief justice in this case, what, what's, his, what's their real do? That's right. Notice in the middle of uh, the next paragraph or toward the end in every instance before negligence can be predicated of a given act back of the act must be sought and found a duty to the individual complaining the observance of which would have averted or avoided the injury and to my point about the derivative nature of miss paul's graph claim according to justice cardozo the plaintiff sues in her in the next paragraph, the plaintiff sues in her own right for a wrong personal to her and not as the vicarious beneficiary of a breach of duty to another. Now, here is the introduction, okay? And then he goes on and discusses what is called the zone of apprehension or the zone of danger, right? In his view, because of the nondescript nature of the package, Paul's graph was not in the zone of danger, okay? And therefore, no duty was owed to Paul's graph. And that's what he's talking about at the bottom of the paragraph, well, the paragraph, that bleeds into 354. Even then, the orbit of the danger, the zone of apprehension, the zone of danger as disclosed to the eye of reasonable vigilance would be the orbit of the duty. So he's saying it's a relational concept. While Madison might be in the zone of danger of me knocking over this table, 
okay, by ne some negligently falling and doing whatever, uh, Mr. Mr. Jones in the back of the room there is not in the in the zone of danger. Okay, so I owe him no duty not to knock over this table. Next paragraph, after the, the first ellipsis, the risk reasonably to be perceived defines the duty to be obeyed and risk imports relation. It is risk to another or to others within the range of apprehension. The risk to those in the range of apprehension. 354, that's in the, that's about six lines down, 354. In the first full paragraph on 354. Further down, same paragraph, about three quarters, well, three quarters down the page. The range of reasonable apprehension is at times a question for the court, and at times, if varying inferences are possible, a question for the jury. First paragraph under, on 355 under the uh, photograph of the platform. Second sentence, negligence in the abstract, apart from things related, is surely not a tort if indeed it is understandable at all. The consequent, the last line of Justice Cardozo's opinion, the consequences to be followed must first be rooted in a wrong. If the plaintiff is not in the zone of danger, there is no duty owed to the plaintiff, and therefore there can be no breach of that duty, and therefore there is no tort, and there is no wrong. That's where the circle lies. <clears throat> On the flip side of all that, Okay, is Justice Andrew. And so going back to what we said before, okay, he says, wait, 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 wait. Right? A duty is owed not from A to B to C to D, and, and however wide we draw the circle. A duty is owed by all civilized people, okay, citizens of civilized society, to all people at all times to behave as a reasonably prudent person. Okay, and the fact that Mr. Jones is not in the, close enough for me to uh, hurt him with the negligent handling of this podium or this desk doesn't matter. If I negligently handle this podium and it falls, I have breached the duty not to negligently handle the podium, whether or not Mr. Jones is within the zone of danger. Okay. And Justice Andrews, Judge Andrews even says, I mean, think about it. all these, you know, we've got a problem with street racing around here. For those of you in from out of town, we got a real problem. Okay. So you come speeding down 22nd Street at three o'clock in the morning at, you know, 85 miles an hour and nobody's out on the street. What would, what would Cardozo say? There's nobody there. There's no relation. There's no relationship between anybody on the street and the speeder. Therefore, it was not an act of negligence. Justice Andrews said, no, 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 no. Right? The act of driving 85 miles an hour, whether it's 3 a.m. or 2 p.m. or 2 p.m. is an act of negligence in and of itself. And whatever happens because of that act of negligence to whomever, wherever they are, should there's liability should attach. Why don't, and going back to what I said at the beginning of class, 
why don't we attach liability in that instance? Public policy. We've got to, we've got to draw the line somewhere. And it's not about the relationship between, you know, what duty is owed here and duty is owed there and the circles that Cardozo would draw. It's that, well, sometimes some, the decision to draw the circle has got to be made. And where we draw the circle is up to the legislatures and the courts and think about the courts and about the railroad case and the courts in Kansas in 1911 and the courts in New York, right? Or uh, yeah, the courts in New York about the fires and their attitudes toward railroads in New York in, 19, in 1898, 1906, right? So is this line, are these lines arbitrary? Yes, absolutely. Are you raising your hand, Mr. Walker? Or are you well, trying to? I just was just thinking about, you know, because we were talking earlier about the concept of um, those guys just doing a job, you know, them being dealt with, being put on the train. Well, you know, whether it's 21 or 2021, you know, uh, I can understand the senior opinion just because of, unless they were told strictly that putting this, getting this person on this on the train at this particular time would hold them and do it. Like they got a pre-call to say, hey, this person got to catch this train at this particular time. I can see why the zone of danger kind of would be, you know, just because it was an explosion versus the podium falling off of the desk. I can see how the dissenting opinion would be that everybody is old because you never know what other, you know, factors or variables like we were talking earlier would lead to other variables. Right. You know, other, other resulting factors or what have you know. So it's just really a, um, you know, just understanding, trying to understand that concept. Well, it's it's hard to understand, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why I leave, I mean, y'all think this stuff is hard to read. It's hard to build a teeth. <laughs> okay. All right. And I love it every year. I find something else new in this little line of cases that we're talking about tonight that stands out to me. Okay. Um, yes. In this case, if anybody did, would the man who the package belonged to, would he have a duty to, like if she sued him, could, he did know what was in there. Yeah, he did. What's the problem with that? But he dropped it. He, he was the one rushing to the train. He did time. drop it. What's the other problem? Huh? So, Better read the notes. Oh. We don't. Is that not the question? We don't, we don't know who or where he was. He is. Oh, okay. But if we did know, but we did know. Well, did exactly. he have a duty to? Yeah. Well, if he he would have had a duty not to try to chase down a train and possibly drop the package. Yes, absolutely. Because he he was the only person who knew that it, would, it might explode if he dropped. So she just said the only person she would find. Right. <laughs> All right. Look at the look at the first full paragraph of three fifty six. But toward the middle, where there is the unreasonable act and some right that may be affected, there is negligence, whether damage does or does not result. That is immaterial. So we drive down Broadway at a reckless speed. We're negligent whether we strike an approaching car or miss it by an inch. The act itself is wrongful. It is a wrong not only for those who happen to be within the radius of danger but to all who might have been there, a wrong to the public at large. Skip a, skip a couple of paragraphs. The proposition is this, everyone owes to the world at large the duty of refraining from those acts that may unreasonably threaten the safety of others. Such an act occurs. 
Not only is he wrong to whom harm might reasonably be expected to result, but he also, but he also who is in fact injured, even if you be outside what would generally be thought the danger zone. Yes, ma'am. Would that be kind of like an affirmative defense to contributory negligence? It talks about that in the next paragraph. I'm maybe getting too deep into it, but that's what I'm saying. Affirmative it. defense to contributory negligence. Yeah. Where does it say that? First well, of no, you started speaking in the language of courts when speaking of contributory negligence. So I was thinking of the view of the contributory negligence. But I just had that in my portion because I just wanted to ask that. I think the defendant could have avoided the harm. Where where are you? Tell me where you're reading. Like, I read and read that part. Or is this in the language of the courts when speaking of contributory negligence? I believe three care is, is living at those patient effects of that. I'm trying to, I'll speak up when, she, when I find where she's talking. It's in the end of that paragraph right there where you're just talking about as the result. Uh, the material. I just read the proposition is this. A duke here is a duty imposed on each of us. I don't. Yep. What page? It's, it's page. on 356. Yeah. Uh, the last sentence of the second the paragraph. paragraph. We've got three asterisks. Yeah. Oh, I got it. Um, I, I see it. Let me see. Let me think about it. Sorry, I'm going to begin going way too deep into it. That was just my own side note. So. Yeah, let's not let's not go there. Please. <laughs> it went in. I see everybody. Sorry. The crux of the of the descending opinion is on 357. A cause, but not the proximate cause. What we mean by the term proximate is that because of convenience of public policy have a rough sense of justice, the law arbitrarily, there's that word again, declines to trace a series of events beyond a certain point. This is not logic, it is practical politics. Public policy, practical politics. Or skip a couple of sentences. We may regret that the line was drawn just where it was, but drawn somewhere it had to be. the very bottom of 357. It is all a question of expediency. It is all a question of expediency. We have to draw the line somewhere. The lantern that burned all of Chicago. Where do we draw that circle? He acts like that's a hypothetical that actually happened. We don't have that. Yes. So at one point in time, we did a case where there were doing some blasting inside of a city and uh, destroyed a garage. Right. Okay. So when it destroyed a garage, we determined that the blasting company was responsible for any damage and shockwave occurred. So we know that. If we could be able to say that the person who got on the train, we could identify them, would be responsible for the blast. We've got a scale that's fallen over, a blast that's occurred. The railroad ultimately would have been responsible for the scale being properly secured and not falling over. 2020. I mean, so they're so they're focused on 
the act that caused the explosion not I mean, it's, as a lawyer I, I'm asking myself what what would I have pursued in this to get my client made whole? Help me out, Paul. I mean, I, I I don't understand your question. Okay, so so this so this woman in this case gets hit with the scale on on a platform of a railroad. Right. When an explosion happened that was outside of the circle of influence or the proximate cause here of the explosion, it, but yet the shock waves essentially caused cause the scale to fall over and hit her. No, but they can perceive that's the question. That, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. You have to prove that. But that's you right. know, if you're not gonna scale over, how come it wasn't properly secured? I understand it's 1921. All right, all right, Mr. Osha. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> Sina. Okay, so there's a big difference though in the explosion case and in this. In the explosion case with the garage, they were doing the explosions on purpose. So, you know, they were like, we're going to blow this up. Oh, yeah. Well, and yeah. He's actually, like, he's the strict liability thing complicates the issue. Sure. Right. But in, but, so it's like, if, if he dropped the package on her foot, if he negligently dropped the package on her foot, he's strictly liable. No. 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 Blasting is an abnormally dangerous activity. We're complicating the issue, right? I mean, just Andrews would say the blasting, the blasting, the duty is owed to everyone, right? He would love that, right? Because whatever happens, you're blasting. And you cause damage to person or property, no matter how careful you've been, you're liable for the damage to the injury to the person or property. I agree. Okay. I hope I'm answering your question. I don't well, I, I guess where where I'm going with it is, I mean, the railroads arguing that they're that they're not liable because of the acts of its employees, but yet. It's a device that is inside of their control well, and influence that caused her the impact to her persons. Okay. Okay. If so that's saying, the court. The and defense to the railroad company, if we knew who the guy with the package was, is that the falling of the explosion was an intervening cause of the of the fact that the scale, a superseding cause of the fact that the scale was not properly secured. So that's if, the defense. So if I'm I'm a lawyer, I go after the railroad company for the for the scale falling on her and let the railroad company go after their person who got on the train that they can't find. That's I'm kind not, of, I'm, I'm I'm saying that I, I suspect the scale is owned by the railroad company. It's not properly. What I'm telling you is Please. the argument and defense of the railroad company in that situation, right, is that the act of the guy carrying a dangerous package, okay, is a superseding cause of maybe the violation of the duty, the breach of the duty to properly secure the state. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, that's where you're going to. That's where I was. I okay. was impressed. There you go. I also have much of the first full paragraph on 358, but I think we're already um, adequately in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Look at note six at the top of 361. Did y'all notice this little scenario here? What if a train strikes a commuter who is dashed across the tracks in front of it due to the commuter's negligence, not the railroads, and the commuter's body strikes plaintiff who is standing 100 feet away awaiting her own train? Receivable plaintiff. I say no. The Illinois Appellate Court Me, reversed yeah. the trial court's grant of summary judgment for defendant's commuter's state based on defendant's no duty argument and remanding the jury to consider breach and proximate cause. Mm. I've got note eight circled on 361. For the facts, it just goes step by step by step. Was it proceeding? They issued these letters of credit. Where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? So, Mr. Naylor, you got Yan for us? Yes, sir. So Yun and Chang were in a Ford van driving down the interstate expressway when their spare tire uh, came off. They realized that it came off. Chang is a passenger. He gets out, runs across the interstate to retrieve uh, the tire and is struck and killed. And so um, Yun sues everybody that has ever touched the vehicle. That's right. Anybody, <laughs> including, anybody that's ever touched the vehicle. Including, <laughs> including the, the oil change. The oil change company who said, hey, you, way, you might want to fix this. Oh. Okay, and, so, and so the, the court actually gave summary judgment to the defendants. And uh, let me pull it up. So uh, they appealed. And basically what the court said, the court reasoned that in some cases, the issue of proximate cause has been held to be so intertwined with issues of policy as to be treated as a matter of law for the court to determine. In other words, the, the question was whether it was okay to do summary judgment in this case, or could it have gone to the jury? And they came back and said that no, uh, a highly extraordinary event like this, where some guy's dumb enough to run out into an expressway traffic, it, it's, it's okay for the, the court to decide whether it's proximate. Some cause. things are so patently obvious yes. that it's okay to judge, make a judgment as a matter of law. That the if even if there had been negligence in the in the original by some one of these 18 defendants, okay, I'm exaggerating obviously, but not by much. Um, that the super the 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 And I'm going to use Madison's favorite, new favorite term, contributory negligence. <laughs> um, uh, the gentleman in running out into the road to try to retrieve this assembly interrupted the cause and effect chain between whatever might have been one of the defendants or, or multiple defendants, for that matter, negligence, and the, the resulting injury. It interrupted the chain of cause and effect. Very good. All right. I don't. Am I making too light of this? I mean, this seems pretty. I mean, to me, am I being cold? <clears throat> it's not the first time I've been accused of that. <laughs> But what does the dissenting opinion say? Going back to, to Mr. Nam, what does that what does that judge say? Hey, look, we judges are conservative types, right? What may seem apparent to us might not be so apparent to you know a jury of a plaintiff's peers. And so sometimes we may jump the gun, and it's better in almost all circumstances to leave proximate cause to the, to the province of the jury, right?
You know, we come in here in this in this classroom, in this building, we come from several different backgrounds, right? Some of us have, have been exceptionally privileged. Some of us have not. Some of us had scrape for everything that we've ever got. Okay. And it might be reasonable for some folks to go, hey, I need my spare tire assembly back. And I'm going to risk it because I need it and I can't afford another one. You know what I mean? And it might not be for, you know, and I'll say it, a bunch of old white men, right, to decide whether this was patently unreasonable to run across the street. See what I mean? So that judge's only point is that, I mean, his main point is that maybe we shouldn't rush to judgment. We should, we should in almost all cases, um, leave it to the jury, okay? And if it's unreasonable, the jury will find it unreasonable, right? Now, on the flip side of that is note five on 360A. If we have a breach of a, of a duty, okay, to tighten the lug nuts on a, what I think is a new vehicle, let's say new in note five. Yeah, yeah, newly purchased vehicle, okay. And because of that breach of duty, tire gets loose, person has to pull off the road, right? So it's also reasonably foreseeable that if it pulls off the road, somebody's going to stop to help. All right. And then is it foreseeable on the side? I mean, picture it on the Red Mountain Expressway, right? Is it foreseeable that somebody's going to hit the second car or even the first car and injure the planet? Yes. I think that's within the circle, right? That is definitely within the circle if you negligently tighten someone's tire. All right, like I said, I think we're all sufficiently in the mud. Thank you for those of you who are viewing at home. This has been Fun with Flags with Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is rescue doctrine going to be in the final? Have we covered it? No. Then no. We haven't gotten it yet, right? Well, no, because but that note kind of reminds me of that because somebody broke down and somebody stopped to right. help them. Yeah, we haven't gotten it. Okay. I don't think we've gotten it. No. No. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. No, the rescue doctrine is not on the final. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else need my my green medicine? Oh, it's time to have a last day. You're 
Well, I'm going to take a leap of that right like the way. <laughs> as long as it's not the last day for now. Good job. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I I never had that girl. You would have been. No, my boy. My boy. Says, uh, I'm so if the yeah. yeah. so yeah. 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 boy was easy, yeah. 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 you would have been a little bit more sought and more. Are we done, gal? I was raised in go kart. First time they got me on a go kart, they had a horse on the Because nobody could kiss me because I couldn't reach the brakes. <laughs> you know? They would just start doing boy things and then let them in. Because they'll be eating that. Okay. Okay. I don't know. 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 I don